Hello, everyone, and welcome to Soul Talk with Wara. I am your host, Wara Grant. Um, please, as usual, do not forget to subscribe on our YouTube channel, Soul Talk with Wara. Today, I am really excited to be talking to a phenomenal, phenomenal person. I mean, I did not know about organizations like this, but just reading about his business and what he does. I am so excited. And I know you also are very excited um, to hear about what he has to share with us. Today, I'm talking with Patrick. Patrick Hardy, he is the founder and CEO of High Trophy Disaster Management. It is the largest full service small business disaster management company in the US. Patrick has an extensive experience working in the public, private and nonprofit sectors in disaster management from micro businesses to Fortune 500 companies. And he is considered as one of the world's leading experts in disaster preparedness. And we are so honored to have Patrick on the show with us. Patrick, welcome to Soul Talk. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, thank you so much. So for our listeners who are not familiar with what it means, uh, what disaster recovery or what disaster management means, can you just share high level what that means? Well, disaster preparedness is essentially this. It's how to prepare for a disaster, how to respond to one when one occurs, and then how to recover afterwards. And I think a lot of times people forget that those three planks really kind of live in sync. So one really affects the other in a way that um, I think people don't expect. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. And so tell me, how did you even get into disaster recovery? What was your inspiration? Did you just you grew up and you're like, I, I just want to be saving people's lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what happened was that when I was, this is going to be kind of a, a seem like a bit of a strange story, but it's absolutely true, which was when I was in high school, I joined the swim team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids in the swim team said, well, you know, we're going to all go in the summer. We're going to apply to become lifeguards. And so I said, great, would love to become a lifeguard. So I went and became a lifeguard. Then a bunch of them said, we're going to become EMTs. And so I said, okay, let's go do that. Then a bunch of my EMTs said, well, we're going to become medics. And so I said, okay, I'm going to go do that too. That sounds like a lot of fun. And it's so funny because the number of people who matriculate to the next level got smaller and smaller oh, wow. and smaller. And at the same time, I got a college degree. I have degrees in uh, political science and economics. I plan to become a professor. That's what I wanted to do. And, you know, I was in college and you know what happened? Uh, everybody in political science, they have a cause of some yeah. kind. They want to abolish nuclear weapons or they want to solve global famine or deal with climate change or whatever. And I couldn't find mine, no matter how hard I looked. And so in 2005, we had um, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. And right after Hurricane Katrina, it came into place. And I said, that's it. That's what I want to do. I'm going to take my vocational skills as someone who worked on an ambulance yeah. and worked in emergency response and my academic background working in politics, and I'm gonna mix those together. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a letter to the governor of Louisiana, and I said this, I'm a nobody, you don't know who I am, you have no idea who I am, but I wanna be a great emergency manager and I would love to work for you. And she called me and said, I've never gotten a letter like this before, I would love to have you, you're gonna come work for us. And I ended up working for the governor's office of Homeland Security in Louisiana at the highest levels. And I was that working, awesome. and that, it was really great. Exposed. It was a wonderful experience. I that's how I got in. I a lot of guts like to just say, you know what, I'm just gonna do this. Not everybody has that, right? I think that is pretty impressive, Patrick, phenomenal. So what is the best way for a family to prepare for disaster? Like we said before we started uh, the, uh, the interview, 2020, 2021, mm -hmm. we hear of so many disasters and we have the, you know, you hear of the earthquake or tornadoes and things like that. So tell me, what can a family do to prepare themselves for such a disaster? We don't want it, but it, it's inevitable sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely right. And the answer I'm going to tell you is going to surprise you because most of the time, um, other people's answers would say, well, get a disaster plan, buy all this equipment, do all these things. I'm not going to tell you that at all. The key, the key element that is going to make you successful and make your family successful in a disaster is empowering every single person in the household wow. and ensuring that they have what they need in order to be successful. Does that mean equipment? Maybe. Does that mean you have to have a plan? Maybe, 
But what it could also mean is things like this. If you have a child in school, have you read the disaster plan for the school? Mm -hmm. um, do your, are your children authorized to call 911? Do they know what that means? Do they know what expectations are when there's a particular emergency? Do they have the ability to know um, what they would need to take in an evacuation? Because I mean, I've evacuated from places before and I've, and I've worked with many, many schools from coast to coast. And one of the things I tell the, the kids is I say, listen, you're just as important as the teacher. Yeah. You have to, because you are, you are, there's 30 of you and there's one of them. Mm -hmm. And what happens if there's a sub or what happens if there's a guest mm -hmm. or what happens if the teacher gets injured? That has happened before. Yeah. So I empower the kids and I say, you are a responder too. And they actually become some of the best emergency responders. Kids are, are great. I, t I, I joke around all the time with schools. I always say, I'll take a group of children <laughs> over the army corps of engineers any day because they're just they're so enthusiastic but the key is is it's not the gizmos it's yeah. not the red backpacks it's about turning to a child and say and saying i'm going to teach you some of the basic things that we need you to do in an emergency so you're part of our team when you create a team atmosphere and you make it so people are empowered that's when that's when families are really effective in all kinds of that's emergencies. phenomenal that is awesome. And you know, that kind of takes me to my next question is empowering the children, especially now when we have this gun violence. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the gun violence in the schools. So I think mm -hmm. ha having those children to be empowered to say, hey, this is what I will do. And, you know, having them the, know the importance of knowing what their disaster is it evacuation plan. Is that what you call it? Yeah, it's learning about the emergency, what we call the emergency operations plan. Yeah. And the emergency operations plan is essentially three things evacuation, mm -hmm. shelter in place, Got it. and lockdown, wow. right? Okay. Every disaster comes down to one of those three things. So you're absolutely right that kids should know about those plans and not only know about them, because one of the things that I differentiate from, from them is, and this is going to seem a little trite perhaps, but it's the difference between a kid watching a movie mm -hmm. and a kid playing a video game, right? And it seems a little strange, but that's the way I explain it to kids mm -hmm. is I, I say, look, in a movie, the movie is acting on you. Your job is to sit there and watch. That's your job. When you're in a video game, you are interacting with it. You are in charge of the character. You're in charge of the story to some, some extent. So you yes, write the story, mm -hmm. right? So that's the way I talk to kids about it. And that really helps them. And, and as adults, one mm -hmm. of the things I tell them is I say, you need to empower kids. Let them know that they're just as important and they're part of the team too. And they will surprise you because they have a lot of great, great skills and their enthusiasm just can't be beat. So they're, they're really great. And they can do things. If you tell them you're part of a team, mm -hmm. you are just as important as any other person on this team and kids will respond very positively. I love that. I love that. So when you think about what, what questions should we be asking? Like even when you're starting a job or you're at your workplace, what kind of questions should you be asking about the discover uh, the, the uh, disaster recovery plan? I usually ask three questions um, and I, I tell everyone uh, to learn at a minimum three questions. Again, this is a minimum. In the book, I actually talk about 10 things that you should ask and not, they're not long questions or difficult questions. They're 10 quick questions. Um, but the first three that I'll tell you about is you should always ask, so ask your employer, number one, if we have to evacuate the building, where do you want us to go? So if we're evacuating out of here, where should we stand? And I've, I've worked in buildings where literally there's four or five floors and each floor has 10 offices. So you have, you know, an architect's office and your graphics yeah. designers on some other floor that are unrelated companies. And then you'll have a professional school on some other floor. And then you'll have a dental school on floor mm -hmm. five and they're all dumped in the parking lot. And you can't believe the confusion that will happen. You'll see these large amalgamations of people. So what I tell them is I say, tell them where they ought to go in an evacuation, not only because if they're in the building, but what if they're at lunch and then all of a sudden everyone's evacuating and they show up, where are they supposed to go? The second thing is, is in a shelter in place, ask them where the safest place is to go, particularly if you live in a place where you get tornadoes or severe thunderstorm activity, a really good place to shelter is important to know. So asking your employer that. And then the last one is, is if you have to lock down, you need to ask your, your employer, can we lock the doors? Can we close the windows? Can we turn the lights off? I, I actually know buildings where the lights are actually automated because of environmental concerns. So wow. you can't actually touch the light switches. Wow. And so we, so uh, they just didn't know that there was an emergency override, but they had to ask, people didn't know. 
because, and that's something that's obvious, right? But in the book, I also talk about things like you need to ask them things about remote work. Like if you have another pandemic, are you expected to work from home? Um, when are you expected to come back to work? I actually, my very, very first, you're going to love this. My very first client ever was a, an organization that was getting sued because they fired an employee who had an who had, they had, they'd had a hurricane. And so they evacuated the Bill Bill building. And this person lived way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, nowheresville, mm -hmm. Louisiana <laughs> and no cell phone coverage. Wow. And the boss kept trying to call them, coming back to work, come back to work, come back to work. And they ended up terminating them because they said, I can't get in touch with them. And they said, I couldn't talk to you because my cell phone doesn't get coverage out here. Yes. So cr creating these standard policies, what about paychecks? You know, these are questions. And as I said, in the book, I outline them because people, when they work with employers, need to know these things to be effective. Wow. So before I even go into the other questions that I have, I really want to understand or talk about the book since we're started even digging into it. And I'm really excited. When you plan on um, launching this book, right? When is it going to be released? When are you looking to? The release? book is going to be on bookshelves on March 6th, 2023. Beautiful. And do you have a title for it yet so we can mark it down? And or it's, you're still working on it? Uh, the title is Design Any Disaster. Wow. I love it. I love it. Design Any Disaster. That is, that's awesome. So now let me ask you just a few more questions that I have. Not, not a lot. Uh, you know, what should people do when they're having like a major disaster, right? So for example, there's a tornado. We have a lot of those sometimes here in Atlanta. So what do we do? Well, the first thing in a tornado is, is that you need to be thinking about those first three activities. Am I going to evac? Yeah. Am I going to shelter in place? Or am I going to lock down? Well, lockdown, yeah. probably not because this is not that kind of emergency, right? But you do need to, to determine in advance. Again, key word is in advance. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important that sometimes people forget is that really you need to be uh, keeping an eye on what the weather service tells you. So if there's a tornado watch, then you need to be keeping an eye on you know what's going on. But I will tell you this, I actually have a rule of thumb that I do and I write about this in the book too, yeah. which is I say, say this, in any disaster, Whatever the authorities tell you it is, I want you to treat it as one step worse. So whatever they say it is, pretend it's the next step worse. Wow. Okay. Because that, not because I don't want you to, oh, that's why I don't want you to always treat it like, well, this is the worst possible tornado. Of all that. That's, that's yeah. an overreaction. Mm -hmm. But if you take the next level up, that means that, that, that you will, in 99% of the cases, you're not gonna be overstepped by the emergency, mm -hmm. right? So if it says it's a tornado watch, I want you to sort of pretend like it's a tornado warning, um, which means you need to start preparing. Where are you going to go? How are you going to get there? Um, what's the fastest way? Making sure you're putting critical equipment. This happens at offices too. People don't want to, people think, well, I got to grab my laptop. I got to grab my yeah. this. Yeah. I have to, that's time wasted at home. Well, I need to think about this, but it's a watch right now. So I'm not going to worry, but you need to know what's going on so that when the warning hits, you pretend like the tornado's already made ta touchdown. You're already there. Yeah. And then the yeah. tornado never catches you off guard, which is Absolutely. tends to be what happens and what causes a lot of fatalities. So what kind of equipment should we have in our homes, right? Just store either in offices. I know offices have a standard protocol by law, but at home, right? Nobody is monitoring us. So what should we have in our houses and where can we get it? Well, one of the things I tell people is, is I say, don't ever, 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 don't ever, ever <laughs> buy one of those pre-made backpacks. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Here's what I tell, tell people you want. And I, I write about this two. in the book. And that's chapter. why I'm saying what I bought two of them. Oh, have you? Okay. Well, if you've bought one, this is what I encourage you to do. Yeah. Cut it open, take the entire backpack and turn it upside down and shake it. Get every item out. And what I want you to do is I want you to take every item out of plastic. I want you to try the food, you know, a hockey puck. That's probably going to be in there. Yes. You got to eat that. I want you to eat the whole thing. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I want you to take the water, you know, the water, the little water packet. I want you to take one of them. I want you to tear it off and I want you to drink it. Oh my gosh. I, I want you to try those things because I tell people yeah. you need to try it now. Um, because if you're going to rely on this stuff in an emergency, you need to make sure that you're trying this stuff now and with everything else. But what I, if you don't have a red backpack or what I tell people is, is, is start with an empty one. Start mm -hmm. with one that's totally empty. Get a backpack that you like. Weirdly enough, this really makes a difference. Get the color you want. Get it to look the way you want. 
get one that feels comfortable for your back, you know, because the little backpacks, I've literally seen this before where I've had adults that bought these little backpacks from Home Depot and I said, okay, put it on. And they literally couldn't get it on their oh, shoulders, wow. you know, because it's little, it's not meant for that, right? So that's, that's why I, I tell folks, it's time to try this stuff now and do all that because what you'll find is, is that there are things that don't work. I mean, there are flashlights that may not work or may mm -hmm. not work for you, so but true. then, yeah. And if you start with an empty backpack though, you can build it according to your standards, what's right for you, for I your family. Love that. I, and I give you a list of things to think about. I love that because, you know, I, you know, I thought I was, I, I have a red one, I have a blue one. And one day my three-year-old at the time, he opens it up and starts taking stuff out. I'm like, what is all this <laughs> junk? And they, they had this MRE or some kind of food in there. And I said, yeah. is that what they expect me to eat? <laughs> and the actually tasted it. It was horrible. So I'm like, okay. I know there's so many <laughs> non-perishable foods that I can use. So now that is so important. So that's one of the services that your company supports people. So it doesn't have to be a small business. It could also be a family that's looking to uh, protect themselves, right? Those are the kind of services you provide. Yes, it is. I mean, my uh, company, High Tribute Disaster Management, we work with small we work with small businesses primarily because that's been our full focus. So we work with bars and restaurants and nursing yes. homes and charter schools and alligator farms and all kinds of funny businesses. Can't believe the kind of businesses, wow. the way people make money in this country. <laughs> but I also work with families as well. So I have people who connect with me and they and they ask me if, if I would create a plan for their families, which I do. Mm -hmm. And just like a lot of the questions that you've posed to me today are questions that they pose to me directly and say, that for my awesome. family, how do I create this? What kind of, what really needs to be in my backpack? Yes. Um, and by doing that, it gives them, I, I try to give them a sense of empowerment where I say, I can't tell you everything to put in there because I don't know your whole family, mm -hmm. but here's the things that I know that, that, that from our planning, this is what you're going to need. You're going to need these things, you're going to need this, you're going to need that. And in the book, I lay it out for families too, so that they um, have a basic framework of what to be thinking about. And I give them a brand new way of thinking about equipment yeah. because I say, mm -hmm. I think the way we think about supplies and equipment is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so there's a brand new way of doing it that I've used effectively for many, many years for, for our hundreds of thousands of clients mm -hmm. and working with them and developing the right kinds of equipment that's going to be right for your family. And that may not necessarily be right for mine or someone else's. Absolutely. So. Wow. I, I love that. And so I just have one final question, but before that, I am, this is how excited I am about your book. I am going to buy five, the first five copies, please. <laughs> well, and we can definitely share with our guests, but we would love to have you back on the show. So I will let my team know, because when the book is out, we really want to dig into it and kind of talk about the different strategies. And because I think this is information that you don't really think about, right? You're going to work yeah. every day. And I don't even, I've never sat my kids down and said, hey, this is what happens when, if mommy and daddy are in trouble or things like that. So we need right. to start thinking like that. Perfect. My final question um, what if individuals um, need help during a disaster? Um, you have something, you talk, you, you mentioned something about emergency managers. How do they merge with your business and how do you bring that all together to help people? We are doing something tremendously exciting. Um, I inked a partnership with um, the public-private partnership with wow. the United Nations. Wow. And I am the small business uh, chairperson. So, and they invented the role because they didn't have it before. And oh. they asked me if I would sit on there. And I said, yes, I will do that. And so what we have done is that in, in California, um, we actually have a jurisdiction where we are actually putting a small business and family liaison. This is the first in the world, not the country. This is the first in the world. And it is that person will set it there and act as a liaison between emergency management. So with the agency that's in charge of working with first response agencies, working with FEMA, working with the fire services, working with uh, law enforcement. So that group and having a liaison there who will then be able to give tactical, specific, usable advice for families and small businesses, because a lot of times they fall through the cracks because individually, they're only one person, mm -hmm. right? But when you get a collective and you really develop a kind of public-private partnership like that, what it ends up doing is it allows every single person 
um, to be able to have direct engagement. And so we have things like we're going to allow them to ask questions in an emergency. Um, we allow them to have direct interaction, a lot like you would say at an airport when uh, you want to ask a question of airport security, they have a way to actually send them a message. We are doing the exact same thing. It's a pilot program. It's going to be so terrific. And there's something that we're eventually going to push out nationally because we want to try it out and pilot it there. But it's the way that otherwise people would never be able to access emergency managers because they just can't. I mean, imagine three, four people are in charge of an entire massive county with hundreds right. of thousands of people. And so we are doing everything we can. It is my mission in life. And it's my totally professional goal is to put people in a position where they get top quality disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. response, and recovery, no matter what emergency that they're facing. So, so it, it's an innovation and it's something that I'm committed to throughout the rest of my career. I love it. Patrick, I think you're doing great work. Like this is life-saving work, neurosurgeon kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fun. As, as I said, this is like my, um, you know, world famine. I'm trying to do something like that because the conversation right now is so much on climate change. Yeah. And yeah. I look forward to you reading the book and I can't wait to talk yeah. to you next because yeah. I yeah. talk about how people can take control of climate change, yeah. that there are things that they can do. You're not, I'm not going to let you become a victim. I'm going to let you be an empowered responder and I'm going to give you those tools. So you and your listeners are going to get um, it's some, some terrific ideas, some wonderful things that is going to finally allow them not to be, not to have the disaster act on them, but for them to actually the design, the disaster, whatever. I love that may it. Be. Thank you so much. Wow. Patrick, Thank you. I appreciate you. And I cannot wait to bring you back on the show so we can dig deeper into your book. Thank you so much for joining us today on soul talk. Um, before we go, I, I, I wanted to find out, so why high trippy, right? Before you share your your social media <laughs> details, website details. And we have that at the bottom of the screen too. Um, but tell me why, why that name? Because I love it. It's a Greek word that I invented. Um, the word high, H-Y, means to grow. And tropi is the Greek word meaning to change. So it's to grow That's through cool. change. And I do that because, and if you'll notice, the H-Y yes. is an ambigram. So I tell people, no matter whether your world is upside down, I, we always make sure it's always the right side up. Wow, wonderful. Patrick, you have been a phenomenal guest on Soul Talk. I really appreciate you. Well, Garrett, guys, there you have it. We have Patrick Hardy, the CEO of High Trophy. Did I pronounce that correctly? You got it right. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for tuning in today. Please definitely go and check him out. His website is listed at the bottom um, and his information, the ways to contact him. You will not regret it because I cannot wait to get his book when it comes out. So again, my name is Wara Grant. Please follow us on our social media platforms, Instagram and Facebook, Soul Talk with Wara and Twitter. And again, subscribe. Till next time, have a wonderful day.